started. Um, we've asked Beth to come in and talk to us um, a little bit about cybersecurity recruitment. We've been um, hearing about cybersecurity across state government, consistencies, inconsistencies, um, and this was an area of interest for the last meeting. So thank you for joining us. Great. Hello. Good morning. Um, good morning. I am Beth Fastigi, the Commissioner of Human Resources. And as the Commissioner of Human Resources, one of the things that we are um, is on our purview is statewide recruitment. So we assist departments and agencies in helping them recruit talent for the state of Vermont. So uh, Senator Brock asked me to come in and talk about information security recruitment. And luckily, uh, Secretary Quinn is here and he can chime in if there's anything that's not, he feels like it's not quite in sync with what they're doing, but I think we think I've got it. Um, so hiring overall is a challenge throughout the state, throughout all job classes. Unemployment rate is all time lows in the U.S. is 3.6%. Vermont, we're actually lower than that at 2.1%. And then if you go up to, into Chittenden County, where the vast majority of our people are, it's even at a lower unemployment rate. So that really translates to fewer people looking for jobs and um, and a really tight job market. Um, which works out well for people who are looking for work, but not so well for employers looking to hire, and especially people in um, highly technical sought after jobs like cybersecurity. Um, so we have a talent acquisition team, and that's the new kind of word for recruitment, we call it talent acquisition. And we assign those, and also our HR business partners are assigned to various agencies. And we've been working with ADS um, to, pr to bring it, you know, a strategic plan to address their staffing needs, uh, both to attract talent and to retain talent. Um, one of the things that ADS has been doing is really looking how to grow their own employees um, in the recognition of the very uh, tight job market, looking at um, you know, what, what employees they have, how they can develop them um, to bring up their skills to what they need in the future. So they have internal training programs, They've got um, internships, they've hired an intern, and they have another in the pipeline, so that's been really helpful um, and engaged with the cybersecurity program at Norwich University. Um, one of the new things that we've done with our new, we have a new um, recruitment system, so um, it's um, easier for us to maintain talent pools, so if someone's applied for a job but it seems like they might be good for another job, we can kind of keep that and have an easier way of finding that than we ever did um, in the past many years. So that's um, a benefit of our new system. So if we have um, candidates that have expressed interest but haven't, um, we can reach out and say, hey, this job might be, um, you know, might be a good fit for you, why don't you apply for this? Um, so that's been helpful for us. This is our classified pay chart. <laughs> um, so I was going to be actually, I realized that I was going to start talking about um, our pay plan and how it works and the challenges we face, but um, everybody doesn't actually know what our pay chart looks like for the state of Vermont and how we hire people. And it's, it's, very, it's very straightforward. Um, <laughs> you have sure. on the left, you have pay grade, so a lower pay grade is paid less, a higher pay grade, 32, is paid more. As you progress in time, you get step wage increases, so it's very predictable. People know um, what they're going to make in 15 years or in five years, each um, there's a progression, so earlier on in the first five steps, you get an increase every year, then it goes to every two years then it goes to every three years. Um, which is great if you're somebody that's looking for to stay here for a very long time. Um, it's much more appealing to someone who's kind of goes in that in that direction. Like I want a steady employment. I know if I start here, I'll, you know, in 15 or 20 years I'll be making this. Um, it's not so great for young people because they're not seeing they're not, they're not looking really beyond five years. So um, it definitely re rewards longevity. Um, it takes 22 to 24 years to get the top of your pay grade. Um, and as I said, it's not really that attractive for younger workers, but you do know that you're gonna get, um, you know, about three or 4% raise every year. So that's about kind of the value of a step. And also you get, plus that raise typically um, will negotiate with the union and increase. I mean, every year they don't get a 
cost of living or a cost of board increase, but usually there's one. Um, so I just wanted to explain that. Um, and there's a, there's a range, obviously, from low to high. So you can see these are some of the free um, information security job classes we have um, at pay grade 24, 26, and 28. So typically a one is at kind of a lower level and a three is at a higher level. At each range, you either have higher education or more skills or more certifications or more qualifications. Doesn't mean you're necessarily good at it. It just means that you are, um, you're doing work that is at a higher level. And so our highest range for that, you know, higher for that job, actually I'm going to talk about the lowest because that's, I have an example of the lowest range in the bottom, but so starting, our starting pay would be 51000 going up to $80,000. Um, and then um, one of the things also, working for the state of Vermont, we do have a great benefits package. So on average, about $33,000 in benefits, which includes um, full health care. Uh, it's the best health care plan I've ever seen. I think since I started working for the state, I have not seen one bill from um, Indian health care for anything that we've done. They, we, I haven't paid a bill to them since, and we do, our family does use health care. So. Um, that's rare. Um, it's great. <laughs> it's a great plan. Um, retirement, we have really um, um, good retirement plans, especially if you want to stay and work for an employer for a long time. It really does, again, reward longevity. Um, so it's, it encourages people to stay there for 30 years so that then when they retire, they can go elsewhere. It doesn't necessarily consider encourage people who maybe want to work somewhere for a few years or are thinking about only working somewhere for a few years because it's it's a you know it's a, it's the old style defined benefits plan yeah so Beth one of the things that we've talked and you've been moving yep. on and that is this Willis um, system is old mm -hmm. um, and um, how we could replace it uh, do you envision if we end up with a replacement that in fact there would be um, um, components that would do a better job of addressing the issues that you've laid out, particularly um, in terms of um, the earlier on the bringing young people, younger uh, members of the workforce in. So I, I was just wondering, this is what we have today, yes. but you know, we've asked the department to really take a look and see whether we need to overhaul what, what might have been fine three decades ago, but um, may not serve us well today. And our department is charged with, um, statutorily charged with making sure that across state government, people are being paid equitably um, within what type of work they're doing. So we have a classification system that looks at points for a job. Our system is definitely old. Um, it's been around for a long time. It is functional. It works. We know how to work it. We know how to do it. It's also, with our union contracts, our classification system is very much tied to our pay plan, as you can see right here. If you're classified at a pay grade 26, this is how you're compensated, and we negotiate this pay chart with the, with the union. I expect that we will have. We have asked um, the consultant that we have hired to look at both our classification system, our whole system, which is really tied in with our compensation system. So we've asked to look at um, you know, what we can do within the parameters, the existing statutes, and what, what the possibilities are. And um, we're looking forward to finding out what those possibilities are. Because um, looking at other states, I mean, every state has a different classification. Everyone does something different. And um, we're not in as bad a shape as we think. Looking, when I look across and see what other states, what happens in other states, I'm like, oh, I guess we don't have it so bad in Vermont. It's not so but. But um, bad meaning compensation. Bad, bad com meaning. Bad com meaning. Difficult to administer. Our employees are paid um, relatively um, a comparable market wage. We ha don't have as hard a time as recruiting as other as other states may have. Um, especially some of the um, you know the Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. Um, you know people haven't had pay raises in like a hundred years, and it's 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 very you know that's even more challenging because no. Not that the job market isn't challenging, but just no one wants to come work for the state. And I think in Vermont, people still think working for the state is, in general, a, great, a I hope they think it's a great place to work, but I think it is a really good place to work. And um, and our compensation is is we don't want to be we don't want to be above the market. We kind of try to be about ninety percent of the market. We do want employees to um, 
be committed to public service. Um, so it's they're not state employees, and I can attest that are not necessarily, especially the great ones, are not necessarily just in it for the money. They're in it because they're committed to um, serving Vermonters. So that's kind of a factor there. Well, as you look at the pay rates, uh, such as those that you have for information security rates, how do those compare to the market today? For the private sector. Mm -hmm. So we did a quick look because, um, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about a market factor analysis and the amount of work that takes. So we looked at for the pay grade 24, um, which was or the, yeah, pay, which was kind of the lowest, our entry level. And so we looked at that. Um, so this analysis is based on that. And so at an entry level, this um, if you looked at 25% of the market level percentile in Vermont, our step one, our minimum pay range for that 22 is at um, 20, uh, we're at 25% of the market rate. And then when you go to um, step 15, which are the highest, we're at 75% of the average, the market average. So entry level, we can, entry level, we're, we're not too far off, the 90%, which is kind of where we want to be, but when we get up to the um, top pay, that's when we're, that's when it's a little more challenging for us. And that is, again, it's just a very brief analysis that we did um, based on me coming and presenting to you. So it's not a thorough, um, it's, you know, it's not um, a thorough market factor adjustment. So what we have, so within, this is approaches we use to um, address market compensation challenges. Our higher into range program, that's where you look at the pay chart and somebody who has a lot of experience and skills, we can hire them, um, or qualifications, we can hire them at a um, higher step. So instead of, um, so we could bring somebody in, it would be very rare to bring someone in at step 15, but you could bring somebody in at, you know, uh, even step 11, 12, 13, so a much higher percentage than they would be getting otherwise. So that's one of the things that we have done um, um, with ADS, and we do that for a lot of departments to address um, the starting pay. We can, and it's, there's a whole process they have to go to. We, you, know, you have to offer them step one, but then they say, I can't work for that, and then they have to request a salary. So we can't just automatically say, oh, we'll pay you, whatever. We have, still have to try to be, we still have to get them to come as low as possible. That's what we tell the hiring managers, because we don't want to, you know, have everybody come in at really high pay wages. Um, we're trying to look at costs, too. Um, and what's good about that is it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the hiring manager can make that request to human resources, and um, we can approve that almost immediately. Um, and the job offer can go out. Um, higher to range goes with an individual, it doesn't go with a whole job class. So um, it's just based on your skills and abilities, not um, really what's happening in the marketplace as much. And then we also have market, market factor adjustments, and um, Senator Brock he knows about these from when he was in the auditor's office. Um, CPAs and auditors with those skills. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say he audited the use of the MF. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it helped. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, uh, he used it, yeah. not, it's not audited it. Okay. It provides a temporary increase to the base salary range. So everybody that's in that job class gets that pay increase. Um, and we use it for, I know auditor's office has it. We have some people in, um, I think it's Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, the chief medical examiner. So there's, so you know, it's hard to hire um, a doctor for sixty-four dollars an hour, and that's our top wage that we can do. So there's, we can look at the market conditions. We can, we have to do an extensive analysis to make sure we're getting it right. It's more than just looking at the Department of Labor statistics. We actually would hire somebody to actually look at that, look at the job class, and make sure that we're getting it right. Where, in terms of looking at the job class, and to go back to. <clears throat> what we're specifically talking about, about information security analysts, uh, what market <clears throat> are you looking at? Are you looking at a Vermont market, or are you looking more broadly than that? When we did the mark, when we do a market <coughs> factor analysis, we would look at Vermont and we would look more broadly, and we would look at government versus <coughs> private sector. So we would look at all of those things and take those into effect, 
Department to come in, we would work with the department to see um, what that rate would be. Well, I'd, I'd just be very interested, for example, to hear from uh, ADS as to whether or not they believe those numbers are really representative of what those jobs command in the marketplace. And, and as I said, this was just a quick brush. We yeah. wouldn't go out there and say this is the be all end all. I mean, it just, yeah. frankly, it just seems suspiciously low to me based mm -hmm. on, on experience. And as I look at, and look particularly at the Vermont Health Connect project, yeah. at the contractors who are hired for IT jobs compared to what Vermont was paying the people who were providing oversight in, in right. the department. It just seems suspiciously low to me. And as I said, this is the entry level job. This, mm -hmm. these pay, this pay is the entry level job based on Vermont wages. Mm -hmm. So it's not a program or it's, it's what we could figure out was closest to entry level for an information security analyst. Mm -hmm. it's, so in terms of vacancies, uh, for these positions, do you have information on those rates? I do. And how that compares like across state government? So yet one other thing to say about on um, the market factor adjustment, I just it does it definitely requires a lot of time um, to implement and it goes with the job class and not the employee. So there's no discretion based on individual qualifications. So you could have a problem if you did market factor adjustments just for cybersecurity people and didn't do them for other parts of ADS, there would definitely be, John would have, could have issues, fairness issues within the organization. There's also issues if he's looking to promote um, one of those very high paid persons to management, that market factor would go away. So there's, there's other things to consider when you do a market factor adjustment. So we don't ever, it, oh, it takes time to do those and we do those very carefully. Um, so, so if that is something that ADS is looking for, we will, we will absolutely work with them. And um, what do you mean by a temporary supplement? So yeah. temporary until we decide we're not paying market, we're not paying it anymore, or until we redo it. So it could be, it could be suddenly. Very long time. Everyone sees that cybersecurity is the way to go. So the cybersecurity schools are flooded. Now there's a big market for site. There's a lot of people in there, so the wages would come down. We would have the flexibility to lower the to oh, take away the supplement. So if for some reason the, there were it was there was no difficulty in recruiting anybody anymore, it seemed like their wages were mm -hmm. not in parity with the rest of the department or everything else. Then we could we could remove that at any time. Yeah. Um, the current auditor has kind of looked at wage rates. So getting back to Senator Brock's question about are you looking at Vermont or are we mm -hmm. looking at the region? And Vermont as a whole. So if we're looking at Vermont, I think what we're doing is replicating in state government what occurs within that overall Vermont environment relative to wages and um, compensation mm -hmm. with other, other states, particularly when you're getting into um, say the Boston labor market right. or whatever. So uh, if you look at Vermont wages overall compared to other states, right. uh, we we want to uh, we we are paying employees less. So if we're and and you can't do what Vermont government in isolation with the rest of the Vermont employment structure. But um, I'm just <coughs> saying I think that this is. Um, now that everything is so regional and people are, you know, able to move and commute, et cetera, um, uh, the world is kind of a broader place than simply the geographical boundaries of Vermont. And so this is what we see here in state government, in fact, is because we're tied to the Vermont labor market, I'm not questioning that that's not the legitimate place to be, but the overall Vermont labor market in terms of wage compensation. Uh, based on this analysis that was done, is um, is lower it, than is you're lower. get in Boston. That's so right. If I wanted to make or other states, right. yeah. if you want to make more money, you could go to Boston. Yeah. And that's why um, Massachusetts state government probably is going to have a harder time attracting somebody to a cybersecurity role than we might in Vermont. Because if you can get that same job in downtown Boston, working for you know a Fortune 10 company out of the state, but in Vermont, there's not, there probably aren't as many options. I mean, there are some employers that are going to employ cybersecurity people at a high level, but a lot of their, a lot of the cybersecurity people for the banks and stuff are going to be 
probably in, a, in an urban area, a metropolitan area. Well, one of the concerns that I've had, and, and I'd be interested in whether or not there are any observations from, from your end that support this, is uh, a long-term trend over many years for information technology positions generally in that we have not had a local market to be able to fill those jobs when there are significant IT projects. And as a result, and this was also the case with audit, we go and we contract uh, with large firms to provide that resource. The large firm then goes to the Boston market and brings people in, and then we pay three times their hourly rate in order to, for the contractor to provide that same service. Yep. And, and, and so, again, that just, just raises a question in my mind, is the strategy of looking at Vermont as a comparable market, mm -hmm. uh, is that part of the problem why we can't fill some of these critical jobs so often? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say right now we're actually doing, a, I would say, okay. Um, we've, of the 10 incumbents in there, this is what we've kind of got. Two, three, some of you did hire some at <coughs> step one. Mm -hmm. One included an intern that was permanent. We hired that person at step one. Um, entry level job for this, and, and we've been able to um, internally promote people, and um, then we've had three high range ranges. That is this across all of state government. This is no. No, this, these were those IT, IT analysts. Yeah, is, uh, analysts. yeah two, yeah. one, two, and three. So that's those were this was so this is where HR is saying, hey, we got we got the jobs filled, we did our job, you know. <laughs> so this was um, in twenty thousand nine. This was that we did have success in recruiting. Um, we had an information security analyst filled by internal promotion. Uh, a security analyst two um, was hired into range at step two, and then we had a one hired into range. That's the intern I talked about at step one. Um, we were required to do about a two week recruitment. For these, we did three week recruitments. We did have small applicant pools, only about five or six qualified candidates. We may have more people apply, but they didn't really meet the minimum <coughs> applications, and it did take a little bit longer to fill those jobs um, based on 20, but that's that's for the openings we've had in 2019, we've been able to um, meet the needs with higher inter range. Um, that doesn't mean that we will be able to in the future necessarily, I mean, but, um, but I mean, that's kind of the current state. Um, we've had some in, the, in 2018, I think we hired people into range at much higher steps. A few people at higher, or at, at, um, higher level jobs, so we were also able to bring in some more experienced people, I think, at higher steps. Um, I think that's, that's really all I had um, for you. I don't know what other questions you might have. Um, I had just had a question. So obviously, you've been successful if we have no vacancies mm -hmm. now. Um, the, there's two parts, one of which is recruiting and hiring, the other is keeping them. Right. And so um, I was just wondering um, if we had sort of any historical experience. This grow your own is not new. Uh, right. When we brought in the access system in the late 70s, in fact, that's what we ended up, and had the very same issue that you're talking about, Senator Brock, with uh, it was Mathematica and very high paid um, staff brought in working side by side. Um, and it, it's, it does obviously create, um, it's, um, and we ended up getting rid of the contract and, do, and developing it um, in-house, but over time because of problems. But it, um, it's a matter of also how, how we keep staff. And I don't know what our experience is in general with, um, and maybe it's too early to tell. It's a new agency, but what would be nice is to see if we, what that retention experience I looks think like. one of the things about having ADS um, you know as an agency um, and having all you know the classification was the same but you would see people jumping from department to department and and for like the real IT developer jobs or information security that really isn't going to happen anymore so we can have the same thing across across everyone because if we if it was the way it was before. So you're saying that helps stabilize the I think it helps, yeah. it helps stabilize because if it was the way it was before and let's say it was in DII and DII was giving market factor adjustments <coughs> and they weren't giving it an ADS. So before, prior we had departments kind of competing against each other for the talent. Mm -hmm. And now it's, they're, 
you know, there may be better places to work or better projects, but I don't know if you have people like jumping around from departments because you're going to get a promotion or a new class or anything. So that I think I think that's helpful. Hopefully, that will be helpful um, to Secretary Quinn in um, in having um, kind of a more um, more uniform across across state government. I would also say that um, you know a lot of project work and the developer work. Um, I think the state of Vermont is, is so lucky to have some of their for their own systems and to have their own internal developers. That's not think something that we really never I never really experienced in the private sector. So we actually could make changes to our systems. Um, and I was I was really when I came in the state government I was really I was like what we have our own people that do the programming for us. We don't have to have conference calls with another mm -hmm. another. <laughs> Another organization that doesn't understand your business and doesn't understand your system. So um, I understand the um, the benefit of having those people in house that really can, know that really do understand your systems and understand the work and the um, desire to retain those employees. And so we're doing other things. Not on the I would say we're also trying to do a lot of work in human resources on the retention side on kind of more the soft side and the management skills to try to help managers um, onboard those employees in a way that makes them want to keep working for state government um, and a so pivotal to, position in that is the supervisory um, um, training I mean there's research on that in terms of uh, the either the positive or negative impact of yeah. uh, the so, work culture. Yeah, and what we found is um, some departments do it really well, and some departments basically have no resources. They don't know what to do, so they, hey, here's your job, here's your desk, go ahead. And so, so it was very, it wasn't uniform across state government, so we've actually been piloting a new onboarding process. We're actually gonna launch it um, next month. That will be uniform. We'll have um, uniform training across state government. We'll also have, um, really a guide for the supervisors to say here's what you do step by step um, here's how you can um, keep your employee engaged even just the pre-hiring process you've made the job offer give them a call and say and say hello you know um, just wanted to follow up and see if you have any questions mm -hmm. follow that up with an email giving them the specifics um, just really welcome them into the workplace possibly hook them up with a buddy that's not the supervisor that can show them the ropes so there's a lot of things that you can do, and if there's an easy guide that says, here's how you do it, um, and by the way, supervisors, we're going to actually see if you're doing it, because we're going to be somewhat tracking them, not individually, but just through surveys. Um, we hope that we'll have, and we expect that will have a better outcome for our retention overall, not just for um, IT, IT security people or IT people. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm John Quinn, CIO. I'm Nicholas Anderson, the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, so as we've mentioned uh, previously, uh, we have partnered with uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, with their National Cybersecurity Assessment Team uh, their NCATS team that is part of the Department of Homeland Security's new newest agency, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They have a team within that that serves as one of three national cyber centers. Uh, theirs is called the National Cybersecurity <coughs> and Communications Integration Center, or the NCATS. The NCATS, NCATS team, because uh, the federal government likes nothing more than good acronyms. The NCATS team, uh, that National yeah. Cybersecurity no. Assessment Team. Uh, Can you do it again? Can you just do it again? The, in, the NCAC, NCICS, no, what NCATS What is it, Sam? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> the uh, NCIC is the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center because they hold the statutory responsibility for uh, cybersecurity, which is protection of all the .gov infrastructure and all the civilian infrastructure in the United States. And they hold the uh, <coughs> the emergency communications responsibility. So when we have resiliency issues like after 9/11, we saw people couldn't get uh, couldn't get through on the cell towers. Emergency responders had trouble communicating with one another. <coughs> they hold the emergency communications responsibility as well. So is FirstNet project connected to that? 
FirstNet is is connected to part of that, but then FirstNet also has a different program office within GSA and a couple of other use word response within the General Services Administration um, on the federal side. Um, within the NCIC, the NCATS, which is the National Cybersecurity Assessment Team, they provide services that include a risk and vulnerability assessment. We take advantage of several DHS services that they provide free to states, one of which is a cyber hygiene report that we get on a weekly basis where they perform an internet-based scan of the state of Vermont's assets and provide us a report on what outstanding vulnerabilities may be and what they're seeing from an external perspective. Um, they also provide in the internet. That's weekly, you said? Yes, ma'am. That's okay. correct. That's mm -hmm. weekly. Is that something that we would ask them to do, or is that something that... We, we did. We reached okay. out and asked them to do that. So do some states not ask them to do that? That's correct. They're, they're really making a big push right now, and that is a free service that they provide to state, local, tribal, and territorial uh, government entities. Uh, and they're really pushing people to take advantage of that. It's, it's a free service. That's the, the kind of... We, we like, like free. If it's That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. It's, yes. Been, it's been great. It's allowed us to have really well-informed... Uh, really well informed conversations with both our vendor community and some of the people that are outside of the state government's purview um, because within our vermont.gov uh, infrastructure and within the old state.vt.us there are some cities uh, some municipalities that are in there as well okay. that are hosting things and where it allows us to have a conversation with them as well about what if we see some of their vulnerabilities what might they be are there some parts of state government that are not included in this uh, examination uh, there are, so I'm. Uh, I would be willing to bet that uh, you know anything that is outside of Vermont.gov to include uh, the legislature is not included. Um, I know the Secretary of State's office is not included in that, but they have a separate agreement with with DHS where they're getting the cyber hygiene reports as well, just mm -hmm. for for their their SOS.vt.us. I think it is is their their domain extension. SOS.state.vt.us domain extension. So the question is of those things uh, that are state government entities that are not included, uh, does that suggest that there are other unaddressed or unknown vulnerabilities because these things are not being looked at? I'd say that is, uh, I'd say even more, even more broadly than just the scope of web servers that are externally facing. I'd say things that are not being centrally managed within state governments that are part of IT that has been hosted in a legacy way inside of another department mm -hmm. or an agency or maybe a third party board or commission. I'd say all, all of those things in aggregate uh, represent a risk that may not be known to us when we're trying to centrally manage the risk and trying to centrally mitigate it for the state. And so Is you're not engine? getting a read on that with the hygiene report? That Correct, so the, the cyber hygiene report is essentially executive branch and AES's customers that are residing within that Vermont.gov core infrastructure. That's, that's, what, that's what we're getting. Could you give us some examples um, that would be outside this that you're saying are not subject to this weekly hygiene uh, review? Just, you said certain boards and commission, you said not the, not sure. the legislature, but judiciary, is that outside as well? I would have to look at some of the judiciary's assets um, for some of the things <coughs> that they're that they are doing uh, because they they are an ADS customer as well. Yeah. Okay. For some of those, they're they're absolutely <coughs> included in that, and they parts of it would be. I couldn't speak authoritatively whether or not the judiciary has some some web servers that are being hosted in a legacy way that are not Vermont.gov domain. The the reason that I'm asking, I guess it's following up, uh, and that it with your your question um if in fact these whatever they are and i haven't got a clue what that inventory of entities that are outside this weekly um uh hygiene <laughs> hygiene yeah. it sounds like public health yeah. mm -hmm. um uh review and if they pose vulnerabilities do we have um, an inventory of where those vulner uh, where those vulnerabilities exist. So in, in many, I'm sorry, yeah. You know, I want to actually just follow on to the question, is there any correlation between the sheet that you've put together, the chart that you put together for us around ADS services and Senator's question? There, w there would be. Uh, mm -hmm. We can certainly uh, extend the spreadsheet that we have yeah. to, to check that off. As the That's the whole intent of that spreadsheet, mm -hmm. is yeah. to be able to capture how each individual entity within state government's IT IT security, IT procurement, all of those things are being managed. 
So I think so yes. Understand it. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So it'd be very, very helpful if you if you do in fact extend uh, that spreadsheet to include. We will. Uh, so I'll, I'll go over at a high level what the overall methodology was that the, uh, the ACAT <coughs> follows during a risk and vulnerability assessments. It includes both an external look into the state and an internal look into the state. So they have a team of uh, five people that are well-qualified cybersecurity experts that are DHS government employees uh, that lead the engagement and kick it off with us. And this normally starts about 60 days before we'll ever see your engagement. So we made the request made the request probably before the first of the year or right around the first of the year. Uh, had a kickoff uh, with them. I uh, had a couple of phone calls in March to finalize the fact that we were going to be placed on their schedule. And then in April, actually had the kickoff meetings to begin planning the scope of the project. The scope of the project for, uh, for this risk and vulnerability assessment was all of ADS's core infrastructure that we needed to provide services uh, to the state government and the Secretary of State's systems excluding the actual election systems themselves. The election systems aren't connected to the internet. <coughs> Those aren't network accessible. Um, so I just want to make that note, but it did include the Secretary of State's sort of business and administrative systems as well. And was the Secretary of State's office aware that that was going to be happening? Yes, okay. yes. So the, uh, they have an IT manager over there. His name is John Welch. Mm -hmm. And uh, John was actually part of the phone calls doing this. He participated in generating the paperwork for the NRI scope and kind of co-signing off on everything. So what we're going to see is your core, ADS core functions and the Secretary of State's the Secretary of State outside State of elections. Ad administrative systems, things like uh, lobbying registration, corporate registrations, um, online voter registration, uh, database, things like that. Um, so that was the scope of the, uh, of the assessment. Uh, we began that planning in earnest after the kickoff meeting in April. Uh, this actually uh, went through in, uh, in June. Uh, a couple of weeks later, we got an outbreak, and now we've prepared our plan of action for, uh, for getting to close out some of the recommendations that DHS provided for us in kind of big four buckets. We have, uh, we have codified that in the categories of vulnerability management, uh, credentialing management, access control, uh, spear phishing and phishing awareness, and overall security coordinator. Spear phishing? Yes, ma'am. So, um, so okay. we're phishing. New, new term for us, Jen. <laughs> I've heard of phishing, but. We're PH phishing is yeah. just in general sending out that. Yeah, sending Every, out those yeah. emails, which we mm -hmm. performed as part of this assessment. We, we phished our own state of Vermont employees. Uh -huh. Spear phishing is going after high value targets, it's going after high profile targets, and we may be putting a little bit more work into doing that. So it could say. So it's a much more targeted. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they, they <coughs> would be chosen an individual and say, this person's a board of this, we want to target them because we're looking for this specific piece of information. And more targeted based on maybe your role in, in an organization. It's like for me, if they know that I'm <coughs> Nick Anderson and I do security work and I live here in Montpelier and maybe I have a, a daughter who's 10 years old, maybe they're going to send things to me and say, well, you know, I can see from LinkedIn that it says he lives in Montpelier, I can see that from his Facebook, you know, maybe I need to target things and say this is pertaining to after school activities for Montpelier schools and see if I can get him to click on a link that's going to download a malicious mm -hmm. executable that's going to provide something there or maybe if I know that uh, you know, I'm trying to target the commissioner of DHR, maybe I'm going to send something pertaining to human resources information as a link or as an attachment and hope that she clicks on it. Say, oh, is this something <coughs> that's about somebody who's a peer of mine or industry group is saying to me? Mm. Uh, or maybe they, they mask themselves as a mm. constituent and say, I specifically So have it's a very here. targeted to an individual it's, it's, to get them to. It's crafted to yeah. you. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so we did participate in that, and we have an action plan that we put together. Um, today is our final day for comments that we opened it up to all of our agency IT leaders to provide commentary on that plan of action to establish our milestones, and we're preparing next week to work with our own enterprise uh, uh, project management office to kick this off as a formally managed project to govern it in the right way and to make sure that we're tracking and holding ourselves accountable for closing out these vulnerabilities and these risks to the state of Vermont enterprise. Is this really a project or is this really an ongoing 
um, um, security uh, protocol that I, I, that we should retain. I, I, I'm just. I'm could you clarify that? Yeah. Right now, I'm looking at it as a project, this phase, to get it, to get up to a level where we feel is sufficient, mm -hmm. and then from there on, it'll be an ongoing okay. operation and maintenance activity. Okay, that's the. Um, Oh, that word. I would love a definition of that. Sufficient. O and M? Sufficient. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, no. Any other questions that we want to ask? So this chart, okay. does this go with that? Is yeah. that, it, could you explain this document that you just gave us? This is, this, is, for this is not part of this uh, oh. testimony. Oh. This oh. is the... Uh, 10 minutes I have later on this morning. Oh, oh okay. That's oh, my dad. Sorry. Oh, oh well, don't. <laughs> that's fine. Getting ahead of don't myself. Oh, I was like, <laughs> great. Um, any, do we have, do we have anybody from Much IT? Um, I don't. No, Kevin is not here. I don't believe Kevin is available. Okay, right okay. Great. Jeff, do you have any questions in open session? Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Jeff Lower. I'm the CIO of the judiciary. Court Administrator, uh, Patricia Gable. Uh, we're still unclear, since we weren't included in any of the planning or results of this process, whether or not judiciary resources were part of this scanning work. Okay. Yes. The ones that you received from ADS were. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know if you want to comment yeah, on so that. Yeah, so may I? Uh, sure. Comment? Absolutely. So the, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, Patricia Gable, I'm the State Court Administrator. And um, just as a, um, without more of the detail, I think the Supreme Court would be very concerned to hear that DHS was scanning judiciary files without the judiciary notice. And so we um, want to have a good uh, collaborative relationship with the other branches regarding cybersecurity. But it's very important to understand the distinction between the kind of content that is in our um, in our um, electronic files, and that we, as a customer, need to know um, not only what which of our files have been reviewed without the Supreme Court's knowledge, but also is there any capacity for whoever was in those files to retain some kind of presence in our files where there's a continuous. So I, again, I'm speaking from you know technical knowledge other than what I um, just heard when I came in, but that is something really important that we need to resolve as we work together with the other agencies. So the part I'll touch on in open session is that uh, we didn't tell um, any of our customers um, what we were what we were doing because as soon as we do, everyone starts to you know scramble and tighten up their applications and tighten it tighten up their websites and do things that should have been done but maybe weren't but no, knowing that there's a scan coming people start to you know mm -hmm. lock their doors and windows so the only people that knew about it were Nick and I and some of the security staff uh, by design not even all of the security staff right yeah. and the um, Secretary of State's office and the Secretary of State's office um, right they, 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 they knew because they uh, AAA they had submitted a separate request to DHS to take a look at them and for efficiency's sake mm -hmm. we we asked them just to put the, put the two together. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you, so this is just going to be a random kind of all over the place question, sorry. Um, is that just, that's just a decision that you make as the secretary? Do you consult like with the governor's office? Is this, that's a decision is that your I purview? Okay. It's a standard protocol. To do? To do, do it this way, testing. right, yes. and and to keep it a very, um, very closed process so that you can um, get the best return. I guess what you're saying is you want to make sure that um, it's sort of like um, it's a healthcare facility that's a, it's told we're coming to visit on a certain day, and right. they right. all of a sudden change the linens and clean the floors or something. Right. Right. Um, so I, that, I was just you know. Wondering whether is, this is the way that uh, these kinds of security scans are undertaken. And part of it is we want to see how our own IT personnel and the IT personnel throughout the state, we want to see how they react. We want to see, do they notice that somebody is present within the network? 
you know, uh, how close can I, are they really keeping on the resources that we're charged with safeguarding? You know, it's kind of like um, TSA, you're going through, they're going through the airport. TSA regularly engages, I, I participated with them when I was a DHS employee, regularly engages in security assessments and they're entirely unannounced to employees when you're going through and you're attempting to smuggle in weapons through airport security. You know, because you want to be able to test the rigorousness of that local facility and being able to appropriately screen for that hazardous material. The same thing with information security. We want to be able to test just just like it was a regular regular day here working for the state of Vermont. We want to be able to test the ability to identify and respond to security incidents as they occur. So, how um, has this? Have we had a homeland security assessment on, as ADS previously? I don't believe so. How about SDII? I don't believe so. So. Was this so? The so first? no, as ADS. I was, okay. I was thinking historically okay. long term. I don't believe that we've we've ever engaged uh, homeland security in an assessment like this before, not okay. to my knowledge. Okay. And so when the center's question around you know is this protocol, if this is protocol, where has that been developed? So we have done other types of penetration testing on systems uh, <coughs> in the past. A uh, couple of years since ADS has been created uh, with Norwich University. We, we'll take a specific system maybe um, during their uh, weekly uh, or their week residence during the summer and the, the, the team goes ahead and tries to uh, attack a system and gain entry into the system. Um, the first year we made the mistake of letting um, the business team and IT team know that this was happening. Um, and uh, magically the box was updated and firewalled and protected to the point where um, it was secure. Um, but looking at it before that, they, they would have been into the system in you know, probably a short period of time. And that was a couple years ago when we fixed that situation. This, this year, um, we notified the commissioner of um, the agency that, of the system that we looked at and um, didn't go any further than that. And we. You know, we, we uh, found some vulnerabilities that we've since fixed. Uh, but, you know, the more people you tell, the, the, the less of a actual real world type of or, um, real experience you get. I'm sorry. Is it Peg? Pat. 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 Excuse me. Pat and Jeff. I, I have a question for you. Um, have you had or asked for a DHS scan before or testing? before that no, you're aware not. of? Okay. I might also add, uh, as uh, Nick mentioned, uh, MCIT leads uh, getting feedback and developing an action plan. Uh, we've had no exposure to any information. Okay. Other questions from the committee? Um, I'm, I'm asking this question because I'm totally um, a neophyte in this world of cybersecurity. Um, but people are really concerned who has access to these systems and who has access to data. And to some extent, I think Pat referenced, you know, in terms of when a review is done. In other words, could someone, and you told me there are people that have um, enhanced privileges and they can go into the system. And I understand the need to, uh, for security. I guess um, the, the question becomes one of we all have these confidentialities. There's some very sensitive information. So how does how do these um, uh, uh, reviews protect of that? In other words, if I want to say I think Senator Brock is absolutely horrible because of X Y Z, could somebody actually go in and um, and have access to those kinds of exchanges as part of this review? I, I'm just wondering what. Uh, what are the implications of this? Or are you looking at something very technical in terms of ability to access as opposed to, you know, a particular correspondence between individuals or <coughs> a health record or, you know, a, a child welfare case? Uh, that, could you just give us some understanding of what uh, that means relative to the systems and the information um, that would be contained in that system? Yes, ma'am. So the uh, so we did have the Attorney General's Office review our agreement with the Department of Homeland Security ahead of time. So mm -hmm. there's both a letter 
that outlines the kind of the scope of the engagement as well as the, the confidentiality that's required by the Department of Homeland Security when they do this. Uh, some of the specific lens through which the Attorney General's Office reviewed this, and this is why it took us about eight weeks to get from <coughs> initial project kickoff to actual project initiation, was some specific review given the ongoing litigation involving the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that DHS personnel, though this was an entirely separate agency and different work function, would not have access to any data regarding that ongoing litigation. Um, so I'd say no, in general, they don't have access to files or information of a sensitive nature, um, mostly because they we have people sitting right there with them while this is ongoing. Um, every single time, I, you know, I'd probably give you a few more details in a few minutes, but um, if they had a department in particular that they said they found what they believe to be a vulnerability in one of their web servers that happens to hold some files in it, they would you know, kind of raise their hands and engage with our team, whoever was in the room with them at that time or right down the hallway and say, hey, we found this server, we found this vulnerability, is it okay if we go in there and, and, and exploit that? Is it okay if we go in there and see what's in this server and see what, see what we can find and dig a little bit further? So, so we, here's a check in place, Nick would call and say, you know, we, we see something here, is it okay that we enter this area? So there was several checks along the way and we were careful about, you know, which areas we entered. They, they did not have unfettered access to our, to our infrastructure or to our, to our customer base at all. But I would say, yes, this is, this is something we're going to continue to do on a regular ongoing basis. <clears throat> and so we have, um, as our attorney has reminded me, uh, we have a state law about knowingly disclosing personal, personally identifiable info to the U.S. government. What guarantees do we have? Um, how are we assured that uh, the government is not keeping any of this information? Yeah, I think that would be a, a question really for our uh, attorney, um, the AG's office. I mean, they were brought into this process to do a legal review for that specific reason. For your attorney at the AG's office? Well, yeah, for the Attorney General's office. So we have, we have two different assistant attorney generals that reviewed the letter of engagement specifically, the confidentiality of information and any ability for, for data retention within this agreement. Okay. They reviewed it, but does was there anything in the agreement that prohibited it? I would have to go back and look at the specific clause to give you the, the details of that, sir. I know I can tell you that it was specifically referenced, I believe, but I, I, I'd want to go okay. back. Okay. Again, would. if you could just give us feedback as to the, the, the nature of what restrictions are placed on looking at information uh, other than looking at systems and, and vulnerabilities, but looking at actual information and files, one, and two, retention of information and files. If those things are addressed in the agreement that you have. Okay. It's, yeah, it sort of conjures up the concerns with around the facial recognition right. um, data that was um, shared with us. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, of course, there's no prohibition to do any of that for legislators. They can retain any of everything that we do and talk about, including our faces. <laughs> including our faces. <laughs> okay, do we have any other questions? <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so you have additional information to provide for us. Do you, you have any other information that can be provided for us in open session, in your opinion? No, I think so. Okay, so we've asked our attorney <coughs> to draft us a memo um, regarding executive session, um, which we have. Um, and uh, it's really important to me that we're as transparent as possible, but also that we respect um, the security mm -hmm. issues here. So we'll be very cautious uh, when we are in executive session. I think we have asked that um, the legislature, or the, excuse me, judiciary members stay in. Uh, we had also asked to have legislative IT stay in if they were available, which they are not. And so I think we will ask um, our, our attorney, obviously, so do you want a motion to go into go it? Into it yes. yes. Happy to, you know, have our customer in, in the room to, to hear what we have to say. 
but you know, outside of that, I think it's really a need to know basis on, on who's in here. So we have the judiciary. Yep, who's our customer? We have our attorney. Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, we have uh, joint IT. We have joint, Dan and yeah. Catherine. Yes, Dan and Catherine. Okay. Is that? And what role would they play in this? Like what? <clears throat> Which they well, are you referring to? Uh, Dan and Catherine. Dan and Catherine. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to clarify that. And I, I, I don't okay. feel qualified to speak. I mean, I don't okay. I don't know if you want Dan to say, since he's okay. much more technology than I am. Yeah. So, I think um, I Dan think has been contracted by the legislature to provide some oversight on our behalf in terms of IT projects. Mm -hmm. We also have an MOU okay. on confidentiality with um, between our office and with Dan specifically, and on the work he does with the uh, eight, the with the administration. Okay. So he has access to. So you're getting the boot, but Dan can stay. Oh, that's oh, fine with okay. me. Well, it, 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 it's Catherine. Yeah, we'll so love Catherine. Is that, yeah. is that okay? Yeah. Let's just be completely honest. We're we're not sharing this information regarding the specific vulnerabilities with our own employees inside the agency. They're going to be receiving a two two page action memo that's going to outline what we're doing about it and how we're going to ensure in this my entire security staff has been using this. And I would like to reiterate for you and for the committee that I think this is a very serious issue, um, but I also think the legislature must um, have some ability to provide some oversight or. or but the understanding it. for us anyone who is here in executive session is what we're told is confidential is yes. that uh, right. and and not yes. not to be shared yes, yes. just okay. need to know that in advance um, the Mike. news lately some information regarding the use of a non-approved manufacturer's device in our telecommunications systems and I wonder if you could address what the status of that issue is Sure, so um, it came to light, I believe July 1st, did the operator that um, inside of a co-location facility, First Light Communications was using a Huawei device and uh, questioned whether or not Vermont, um, Vermont data was running through that network. Um, so we began to uh, investigate immediately. We asked them for a response outlining you know, how it wasn't part of uh, uh, the Vermont network, and they addressed it um, through a chain of emails and timelines uh, for the Indigital uh, uh, contract, which is the 911 system, the new 911 system that isn't in place yet. But where they, I think where they, they may have failed to really address the issue was around the data services that the Vermont get that Vermont gets in its data data center. We get our, our internet, we have three different internet connections, uh, one through Sovernet, which First Light owns, First Light, and then Detail. So we have three different um, uh, main circuits. And so, you know, I went back to him and said, you know, following up with your timeline here, it shows that, you know, you signed our certification March 11th. You're saying in your timeline that there were still circuits in place in mid-June, what, what's going on here? And this was just a conversation I had two nights ago uh, with their uh, principal technical assistant. And he said, okay, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying. I, I get the way you're reading this. You were never on that old equipment. When we migrate off something like that, we stand up a network identical to it next to it, equipment that we're gonna migrate over to, and we start migrating circuits a little at a time over a period, and their period was over about 18 months. They said, you know, from the state of Vermont was not on that equipment. They've always been on the new equipment, and that was not clear in the communication. So they've assured me that uh, we were not on that Huawei equipment <coughs> for our data services, and that uh, they may have had uh, others on that equipment, but uh, that's really outside of my scope. Whether they had, you know, who their customers were, that's all privileged information, okay. not not for me. But so to go further. Um, I've, I've requested a, uh, a walkthrough of their co-location facilities and data centers that they have that, um, that provide services to the Vermont network. All of them? And, 
Yes. Okay. And they're working on uh, lining that up. Some of those co-location facilities are owned by other providers and need special assistance in order for me to get in. Okay. So we're working on that. Okay. But we've stayed on top of it. So in summary, then, the state of Vermont never was on the equipment no that was the um, topic of the newspaper article. That's correct. Now, because it always raises the question, well, how do you know? There's no way that you can, in effect, audit to determine whether or not you've got correct information. You're basing your conclusion solely on their assertion. That's correct. And, and, and that's why I'm doing the walkthrough. I'd feel better if, you know, if there's no Huawei equipment in the data center anymore, mm -hmm. I at least know from this point forward, there certainly isn't a chance of us being on Huawei equipment. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for your patience, cool. Secretary Condos. Uh, so we have, just to give you a little background if you're not aware, we've been uh, working with ADS to kind of understand uh, where they're providing cybersecurity, where they're sort of providing, uh, you know, you've heard us talking about customers, um, and trying to understand how the various entities that are, are not directly contracted with them are interfacing, how Vermonters' data is being protected. So we wanted to hear from you a bit about that, and then we, I think the committee had also wanted to hear, you know, anything you'd like to share with regard to election. Updates. Sure. So first, l let me just say, uh, this, for the record, uh, Jim Kondo, Secretary of State. Um, we do work with ADS on a regular basis. We do have our own IT team mm -hmm. uh, in our building, and um, uh, we obviously work off of the internet system of, of the state. Um, but we do have our own cybersecurity um, that we operate, but we work, we collaborate with state resources, for instance, the Vermont State Police, the DHS intelligence officer, um, Region 1, CISA, with, with CISA, cyber, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing I've learned in the last year as president of the National Association of Secretaries of State, there's a whole language of, a, of, uh, uh, of uh, short words, acronyms. acronyms. Thanks. Um, and it's, it, it's uh, amazing to me yeah, to hear what they have to, how they talk. I, you know, you get on a phone call with them and you're stopping them every 10 seconds. What was that? What would, what would, what did that mean? <laughs> so in any case, um, we just recently, in fact, uh, uh, Nick was at, uh, attended as well as Kevin Lane from the Vermont State Police, uh, Homeland Security, uh, uh, Ted Gancy from the Vermont, he's the Vermont uh, CISA or DHS intelligence officer, was part of the team that we sent to a regional consortium in Durham, New Hampshire. Uh, for the New England states with DHS out of Boston, Region 1. Uh, we had a forum, if you want to call it, uh, consortium to discuss all the states, threats. We had the FBI, Secret Service, uh, you know, different players that were involved. So uh, we, we are constantly working together. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, and then I'll get into what we're doing just so you have a better feeling for it. Um, so defending our democracy, uh, for the last year as president of the National Association, I've been going around the country and, and on national TV speaking about cybersecurity is, is the, our new normal. Um, it's a race without a finish line. It will never end. We, I have been very outspoken asking uh, Congress to provide sustainable ongoing funding to the states. We can't survive by having a lump sum every 10 or 15 years. We, we got $380 million to the states, of which Vermont's share was $3 million last year. Um, and we have a plan for how we're spending that, and it's public. It's on, on the EAC website, the Election Assistance Commission's website. Um, uh, the last time we had money before that was 2004. And we, at that time, Vermont got somewhere around 15 to $17 million. Uh, which we still have some of that left. We've been very frugal. That's the HABA money. 
and the money we got last year was also HAVA money, and it was left, as we call it, leftover hanging Chad money from 2004. Um, Congress had approved, but never appropriated 100% of the money that they had approved. Uh, this was the remaining 10%, um, and it was divided up amongst the states according to a formula, Vermont's uh, a base formula, uh, the minimum state, we got $3 million. Cal uh, California, I think, got like $34 million. So that's the range. Mm -hmm. um, we were fortunate. Back in 2013, I was in um, D.C. for a conference uh, for National so Association of Secretaries of State. My colleague from Oregon, who she was Secretary of State at the time, she's now the governor out there, uh, mentioned to me at dinner one night that she had uh, her corporation system had been breached, which I thought originally I said, hmm, interesting. Because the corporation system, every piece of information we have on our corporate uh, public face is all public facing. There's nothing that we have behind the scenes. So it's all public information. But she had, apparently they have some information that they keep uh, private, uh, confidential, and it was breached. Um, so I came back from that in 2013, February of 2013, and I asked my IT manager how we were set up for cyber. He said he thought we were in pretty good shape, but it wouldn't hurt to have a second look. So between 13 and 14, we hired a third party. It was actually a Vermont-based company, New Harbor Securities, um, to do a complete physical and uh, cyber um, assessment, vulnerability assessment of all of our systems, um, not just elections, but all of our systems. Um, that was completed in 14, and we asked them as part of that to give us a high, medium, and low uh, priority uh, of, of things to take care of and an approximate cost to do it. Uh, we have knocked off all those things. Um, in 2016, this was when the world of secretaries of state changed. Uh, August of 2016, we were called to a phone call with uh, Secretary Jay Johnson uh, from the DHS to tell us that there were uh, states that had been um, uh, attacked, not breached, attacked. Uh, it was later found out that only one state was actually breached. Uh, for the record, Vermont was not one of the 21 states, and we certainly were not the state that was breached. Um, that state was Illinois. Um, and what happened was uh, the Russians got into their voter registration database. Uh, didn't do anything, just put their signs were there that they were in. Um, w the one thing that I think happened in 2016 that didn't get a lot of play, and this is what I've been harping about with the press, is the fact that, yes, one state was breached, 20 states defended and defended well, which means we were doing our jobs. Um, as I said, Vermont was way ahead of the game. We are considered one of the leaders in the country on cybersecurity with our election system. Um, in 2018, as I said, we had the three million dollars. We have a robust suite of defenses. Um, if we were to tell you everything, we might as well email the presentation over to the Kremlin. Um, I can certainly go into some broad discussion about what we do. Uh, and I will, um, but I'm going to reserve that till the end. Um, we have, uh, again, we have a new election management system that was in implemented in 2015. Uh, we call it VEMS, Vermont Election Management System. Because it's a new system, it was actually came with added security, and we had already built in cybersecurity requirements into our RFP. We monitor our systems on a daily basis. We work hard to, oops, sorry, we work hard to keep the bad actors out. And please keep in mind, when we talk about bad actors trying to get into your system, they're not necessarily trying to get into just your system. They're trying to get into your system and then seeing what other doors are open for them to go to. So we have a connection, for instance, to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, they could try to get into our system so that, and, and when they get in there to see, oh, if we can go over here to the motor vehicle department or over to the tax department. And that's the issue I think that, that uh, Secretary Quinn and uh, Nick Anderson have to fight all the time with all the different agencies is, is the bad guys are trying to get wherever they can. They're looking for vulnerabilities. They're looking for weaknesses. 
Um, we contracted starting in 2016 prior to the 16 election with DHS. I shouldn't say contracted, it wasn't really a contract. They do it on a regular basis, weekly. Uh, cyber scan, they look to see if we have any vulnerabilities that have opened up in the, in the last week. So we do that on a weekly basis and we get a report. With Homeland Security? With Homeland Security. Just like a hygiene report? Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, we have a what's called an Albert monitor. The state actually has two of them. We also signed up so that we could get our own, which basically monitors internet traffic coming into your system. Uh, and it takes it in real time, sends it back to the Center for Internet Security, which is under contract <coughs> to the Department of Homeland Security. They can tell, tell us within 10 or 15 minutes if we're being attacked or not. Um, we do. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question around. So, with the with that um, with that Albert monitor and with our law mm -hmm. that we can, we cannot. Um, how do we know that the federal government is not? Maintaining any of those. Um, There's no confidential information. It's IP addresses that are going back okay. and forth. Okay. So, and, and I'll get into a little bit more okay. on, on another piece of that. Um, it, this is not going in and actually seeing our confidential information. Okay. Uh, we do annual penetration testing where they, uh, we hire a, a firm, and um, as I, I'm not sure whether. Uh, Nick Anderson had said anything about it, but we always hire a different firm each time to actually do uh, uh, try to penetrate our system. And the reason we hire a different firm each time is so we have a different set of eyes on it. So we're not just getting one set of eyes that has one method of operation and that's all they do. We hire a different set to see if we can find anything. That's on top of the cyber scan, which is looking. And by the way, the cyber hygiene scan, essentially what it is, is like, a burglar walking up to your house in the middle of the night, trying the doorknob, looking in the windows to see what's there. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, the, the cyber scan is taking a look to see if there are any doors that are left open. Um, we enacted, as part of the money that we got last year, um, we, we enacted two-factor authentication for any individual that has to get into the Vermont election management system. That means town clerks and any of their people. So if they, have, uh, uh, if they have access to the system, to the management system, they have to go through a two-factor authentication. We also did it for our own staff. And we do an annual uh, town clerk WebEx cyber training. Um, it's a, it's a two-hour WebEx. Uh, we were fortunate. The first time we did it, we had 235 out of 246 towns wow. that, that actually participated in it. So we feel pretty good about that. It's it's a it's a very basic, gives them simple information, things like phishing, spear phishing emails, and things like that. What to look for, and we're doing that on an annual basis. Um, we built in re resiliency. We have the automatic voter registration, which provides us with a much more accurate and better efficiency uh, re voter registration database. We do a daily backup of our voter registration database. So even if a bad guy get in um, and destroyed, let's say just destroyed it, we would just be able to go back 24 hours and reset our uh, voter registration database. That would disrupt an election, wouldn't it? It could. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of the resiliency that we have is, is the fact that we do have that voter registration backup, daily backup. Um, we also have same-day voter registration, so no voter will be turned away. If they're eligible, they'll be able to sign up. Um, and we, we have other internal threat mitigation measures that are in place, limiting the amount of damage that a bad actor can do if they were successful at getting in. As far as the vote tabulators themselves, so Vermont uses optical scanners. They're not connected to the internet in any way. They're not connected by hardwire, by Wi-Fi, by remote access software. Is that true? Um, but that's not true for every state, Jim. It's true for probably 95% of the states. Okay. Um, there are some states that actually link, you know, if you have several of these at a, at a polling place, they might link them together to get one set of numbers at the end of the night. Uh, but it's not, not very many of them that I know of uh, actually 
are connected to the internet to submit their information. So what we have is a system that allows the, the machines take a look at the paper ballot. But not every state has the paper ballot that you have the backup. Is that well, the roughly forty mm -hmm. states have paper ballots? Uh, in most cases, um, I think it's like 38 or 39 actually have totally paper ballots. There's a few that might have a hybrid where they have some paper ballots and some not. And then there's a handful, five or six states, that have no paper ballots whatsoever. And I don't know how they do a recount. Yeah, I think I, that's what I've heard is that, uh, is that they, um, what they do is, <laughs> is they go in and, and you hit a button and, and the machine does a recount. It says here it is, and Randy, as a as Senator Brock, as a, as a as a former auditor, I don't know how that works. <laughs> so uh, it, we have a robust uh, actual audit that we do post election. Uh, we do five percent of the towns that are randomly selected. Um, we we used to do just four towns, and it used to be two races: a federal race and a state race. Now we do. 5% of the towns, and we do 100% of the ballots in that town, and 100% of the races on that ballot. So, and we've not found that, that we've changed under my tenure probably around 2012. Uh, but we have not changed, um, we have not seen any discrepancy whatsoever. Uh, we also have recounts that occur um, throughout the state, um, although I think there was one Kind of infamous one, I think, uh, two years ago, um, in um, Orange, um, but that was really more of a process problem. It wasn't really the ballot problem, but the simplest solution, audit solution, is the fact that we have a paper ballot. Mm -hmm. We have something to go back to, and that paper ballot, all those paper ballots are kept, are sealed, and kept in the vault for 22 months after the election uh, and they can't destroy them until after the 22 months in case there's anything that comes up our audit completely uses a completely different software has nothing no and completely different set of machines does not use the same machine as what we've used it, in fact it's a much different more up-to-date type of system um, and end of the day, we have, a, in fact, you can probably look it up on our website, but we have a actual file of the, of the towns that were, um, uh, that were audited, and you can actually go in and see the ballots that were on that file. So it's really a, a robust uh, audit procedure that we have. Um, and we've actually, when I first took office, there were no rules around this. It was just saying the Secretary of State will conduct uh, audits, the Secretary of State will pick the machine for mm -hmm. vote tabulation. And what we have done since then is put rules in place that actually have criteria that can be measured. So uh, we have looked at that completely. And I also want to talk about vo uh, vote tabulators because we do not have 100% coverage of vote tabulators in this state. Um, the vote tabulators, which again are optical scanners, they don't do anything but just scan the ballot. Um, we only have about 54% of the towns that actually use vote tabulators, but they represent 80% of the vote. Uh, if you want more firm numbers, I can tell you that it's about 235 towns, I'm sorry, 135 towns that have vote tabulators and about 110, 111 that do not. That's because of a state law that the legislature passed a couple of years ago that says any town over 1,000 voters must have uh, a vote tabulator. So uh, it used to be it was really up to the town whether they wanted to or not. Now there's a, there is a mandate. We pay for that. <coughs> the state pays for it through the HABA money. So do you think that system is working well? Is it fine yes. to maintain that system as it is? Yeah, well that's the other part of this. First of all, um, one of the concerns is always about the memory cards. And how are those memory cards kept? So the, the vendor who makes puts the vendor cards together for us, uh, actually has a secure facility, it's under 24 hour lock and key pass card to get in, they know who, who's going in that room. The, the, tab the um, computers that they use have never, not 
They are not. They have never been connected to the internet in any way. And they don't take our information on a thumb drive that we send to them mm -hmm. or an email file. They don't take that and plug that into their system. They actually manually put it into their system. And this is all designed around security purposes mm -hmm. to prevent uh, any infection that might come in from outside. Um, so, and, and those memory cards are not shipped to the town clerks until two to about three weeks before the election. They keep them, they have a strict chain of custody, they keep them under lock and key in their vaults. Um, they have to, anybody that touches those have to be, uh, have to record it, that who touched it, who, who accessed those, those memory cards. About 10 days prior to the election, they take those memory cards out. Each town gets two for each machine that they have, if they have more than one machine. Um, they get two memory cards. Those memory cards, um, they do what is called a logic and accuracy test on those cards um, 10 days before. And then on the morning of, they, they, when they go to fire up their, their, uh, compute, their uh, tabulators uh, before they open for, for voting, they actually make sure that they're all zeroed out and that there's nothing else in there. Um, we also, unlike, I'm, I'm actually surprised when I talk to some of my colleagues, we do an annual maintenance on all of our machines. We have a contract with uh, the vendor that we use for the machines and they go to every town and, and actually do a maintenance on, on the boat tabulators. I mean, it's expensive. It's about, it's just under $50,000 a year, but we think it's important to maintain the integrity of our system, to make sure that all the parts are working, that the systems are working. And on election day, we have, I think it's five people, including one of the five will be at our office, uh, that are monitoring. Um, they, have, they have a computer. We get a readout at the end of the day, the end of election day, of any problems, anything whatsoever. If it, the, the problem was that the thing wasn't working right and they reboot the computer and the computer fires it back up and everything works after that, that's logged in. We have a report for that so we can tell if you know, something came up in XYZ town, here's what the problem was mm -hmm. um, and, and we addressed it. Um, so they have people within an hour's drive of any town in Vermont so that they can make sure that if a problem does occur and sometimes the computers just won't fire up or <coughs> whatever, but you know, they're there to make sure that they can address it. Is there any, um, so how about the under thousand population? Those are hand count. Yeah, and so. So hand count. It's interesting. Are you happy with that? Would you yeah, change but, that if you could with but, magic wand? But it's it's it's, it's interesting, and I, I'm also going to speak to a particular recount uh, that occurred in this state in 2006. But uh, hand count towns actually um, hand counting of ballots. If you're relying on the human eye, and it doesn't always read the way you think. Um, and I'll give you an example, uh, if you don't mind, no, Senator. No, absolutely. Uh, 2006, incumbent state auditor Randy Brock, uh, on election night, won his race by about 180 votes. 134 I think. Votes. 134 votes. You remember exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Tom Salmon was the Democratic um, uh, challenger. He asked for a recount. Following that recount, it had flipped almost exactly. 102. And it, well, almost exactly. Yeah. And he ended up, Tom Salmon won that race. Invest, this is before my time, but investigation of that issue to find out why that, because generally you don't see that kind of a swing in a recount. And that was a phenomenal amount of votes that switched. They found 15 hand count towns, and it wasn't the hand counting of the ballots that were the problem, it was the filling out of the official return of votes, which the town clerks had to fill out by hand and send to us so that we could tally the votes. Um, there were three people in that race. It was Senator Brock, it was um, Mar uh, Levy. Martha Abbott. No, Evie, was Levy, wasn't it? No, it was Martha Abbott. Okay, Martha yeah. Abbott. And, um, and Tom Salmon. And somehow Martha Abbott was the one in the middle on the sheet 
But what happened was she got zero votes in those 15 towns. But somehow, when the clerks were putting the, the numbers in, they put it in the wrong column. So there were 15 towns that didn't count. That didn't count any votes for one or the other, or actually the other. Wow. And it was just a really strange phenomenon. And now we do it completely different, but um, yeah. and there's there's better procedures in place. But so that was that was just the case of, of what happened there. But hand count towns generally because usually when you think about it, a thousand voters or more get tabulators, so the rest of the, those hand count towns are below that. Mm -hmm. And I mean we have some towns like Victory, there's yeah. only seventy two oh, voters. Yeah, right. Um, and would it make sense to put a $7,000 vote tabulator in a town of 72 voters? I don't know. Um, so uh, that's up to you guys. Not... <laughs> so, we know what they're doing, thanks, right? <laughs> um, but in any case, um, there's a lot of procedures that we've upgraded over time. As I said, we did the rulemaking to make sure that even just picking a tabulator. Before it used to be, the statute's clear. Secretary of State gets to decide what tabulator is used. And it has to be consistent throughout the state. Yep. So that's pretty simple. But there was no requirements around it. So we actually built it into the rulemaking <coughs> that we did to say, that, you know, it has to be a paper ballot. It has to be this. It has to be this um, in order to, to get to the, to the choice that the Secretary of State would make. This sheet is the one. Which one's that? Right here, fighting disinformation. Oh, uh, yes. I think that really is going to be our challenge. Uh, this, this is a challenge, and this is probably the biggest threat that I think I heard uh, uh, Secretary Quinn uh, speak to this as well. But um, disinformation and misinformation are the two issues that we're facing right now that are really problematic. Um, we're constantly working to educate our voters to make sure that they are, when they're looking for information, that they look for the information from trusted sources. Both our Twitter account and our Facebook account are blue dot verified. So that means the blue dot means that we are a trusted source. Um, we're constantly working to improve through the National Association of Secretaries of State. We've been working with um, uh, both Facebook and Twitter um, uh, to improve relations, to improve cooperation and collaboration. Um, literally, they never came to one of our conferences before two years ago. Now they're at every one of our conferences. So that's interesting to think about how um, to think about that collaboration. So, uh, and, what and here's nexus, what, what's the nexus there? Okay, so what we've done is we, we told them that there are times, for instance, what do we do if someone sees a post out there that's a Facebook post that says, oh, Democrats vote on Tuesday, Republicans vote on Wednesday, mm -hmm. or the polling place in Burlington is closed because of a fire or something or electrical problem. Um, so, but they're going to extend the hours till 10 o'clock, so you can go after 7. But we know that that's not true. So how do we compete against that kind of information? Um, and that's the kind of stuff that we're trying. What we've done is we now have a, a, a Facebook portal that we can drop information into right away, go directly to Facebook. Uh, with Twitter, what we did in 18 was cumbersome, but it, it worked. I mean, we didn't have any issues, but uh, uh, it, it was a, we had to go through, we used our national association as, as a clearinghouse. So secretaries of state, if they had anything, they would feed it to the national association and they would feed it. They just wanted, they didn't want 50 states bombarding them with stuff. So uh, Twitter wanted us to f focus it more. We're working with them to try to improve that, that collaboration. We also have what's called an election day threat dashboard that DHS uh, stu uh, stood up, and essentially it's a it's a website that we can go to that every state is allowed to go to um, to sign into, and we keep it on all day long on election day, uh, and you can see if there's a problem someplace else in the country. Uh, 
if I had one thing to say, what's the difference since 2016, besides our own internal focus, it's communication between the states, between our federal, state, and local partners, um, and it, that has improved tremendously. Um, so how are you feeling going in? We feel very confident about where we are. Uh, as I said, we're considered one of the leaders in the state. I've been all over the country uh, speaking about cybersecurity and elections, uh, about some of the best practices that I see. Um, you know, we work with all of our partners. Um, we can't do this alone. No state can do this. You give them a list of, of all your contacts, and they'll send a, an email to those people to see if they can get in through them. As I, you know, I heard uh, uh, Nick Anderson say, you know, spear phishing is probably 80% or more of the breaches in computer systems in this country. Just because they, someone clicked on an email not knowing where what it was, and people were able to grab your credentials and then go get into a, a website. Um, I think. So uh, what are we doing working with our state and federal partners? Uh, as I said, our IT director, director collaborates regularly with Nick Anderson uh, from the Vermont CISO and Ted Gancy, the Vermont DHS intelligence officer. Uh, we are members of the EI ISAC and MS ISAC. Some more acronyms. Uh, MS ISAC stands for Multi-State Information Sharing Analysis Center. That's what all the states are members of and the, and the territories. Um, the EI ISAC is Election Infrastructure ISAC, Information Sharing <laughs> Analysis Center. Um, it was the fastest, the EI ISAC was the fastest startup of an ISAC that they've had in their history. Um, literally, it started in February of 2018, and today we have 50 states, three territories, and over 1,700 local or county uh, offices that are members of the EI ISAC, which just means we get ongoing weekly information. Um, it'll be targeted to us uh, as white means it's not critical, mm -hmm. amber means it's step up, red means you better pay attention. Mm -hmm. A um, couple of, uh, during the 2016 election, we had received uh, through our association a, an alert from the FBI: be on the on the lookout for certain IP addresses. We had con we we checked our logs to see if if there was a problem. We couldn't find anything, but then we sent that information on to. Oh, I guess in the middle of here. We sent it on to the state. Um, system to ADS and they I think I believe they found one of the IP addresses on in their logs uh, a year ago August 24th it was well reported nationally um, my IT manager came to me uh, and said uh, I, we were, I was checking our web application firewalls uh, log information this morning and I found several entries and the information we get will actually list country of origin and it was Russian Federation and Ukraine. He says, what do you want me to do with it? I says, you send it over to ADS, you send it to um, your contacts at the MS ISAC, which is the Center for Internet Security, uh, for their review, and I'll call Department of Homeland Security and let them know about it. They checked with a couple of other states who were not unaware and found that there were a couple of the same IP addresses in a couple of other states, and that within 24 or 36 hours, they issued a nationwide alert to all secretaries of state uh, to be on the lookout for these particular IP addresses. So the system worked. It, it worked, and uh, you know we're, we're pleased with that. Um, we, as I said, we, we collaborate with the, uh, the CISA director at NDC, the CISA Senior Advisor, the, the CISA Region 1 Director, State Homeland Police, uh, State Police Homeland Security 
advisor, um, and, and it's just a constant communication, improved communications. Questions? In terms of potential penetration of election systems generally, uh, IP addresses might be one thing to look at, but are there any information or uh, experience or discussion points with others regarding, uh, in effect, fished IP addresses, IP addresses that look like they're coming from someplace, but actually they're coming from someplace else. They're masked. They're masked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's always the, th the threat. We, we have to be aware of that, and um, our, our web application firewalls will not recognize that when it comes through. It just recognizes, here's an IP address coming through. Yeah. But that's where the information level uh, sharing with others, including the Center for Internet Security, uh, is helpful because they can look at those and see. I've been to their facility in, in East, East Green, Greenbush, New York, and um, they have a huge TV screen, if you want to call it, um, and it's a, it's a map of the world. And what you see is these lines going like this all day long, and they'll be in green, yellow, and red. Green is good, it's a known IP address. Yellow is iffy, and red is we're being attacked. But what you also see is a red line that might come from the Ukraine goes to Houston, Texas. And then from Houston, Texas, it goes a green line over to Washington, D.C. It goes green line? Oh, because they're, they're what they're doing is they're hopping from right. one server to another mm -hmm. to get to where they are. They're masking their IP address. So these are things that we have to keep aware of and we have to just be aware. And that's, that's the kind of stuff we tell our town clerks because, frankly, the opportunity for the vulnerability is really at the town clerk level. I mean, I, I, you know, obviously, if you have a computer, whether it's this this or a PC, a computer is a computer, it's, it's, it's capable of being hacked. The question is, are you putting the defenses in place? Are the defenses robust enough to defend? And that's why it's an ongoing, uh, it needs to be sustainable and ongoing, our collaboration with each other, but also with, uh, you know, funding the, the situations that, uh, that need to be that are required to defend. We're constantly looking at how we can upgrade. We rely on um, the experts. We're not the experts, but we rely on the experts. My IT director is a former um, intelligence officer with the military, um, so he has some background. So let me ask you a question. With regard to your, your cybersecurity efforts, is there another committee in the legislature that you regularly report to about your progress or actions in that regard? Well, I guess the only other committee would probably be GovOps, and, <laughs> and it's, so. more, it's, it, it's more of a 30,000 foot level. Okay. Um, and we don't get into a lot of detail with them on, on I might give them the same presentation <coughs> that I you, but if they want, you know, what are the actual things, I, I have it on a piece of paper, um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be very careful about the information that we put out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we had a, um, a, a reporter that contacted me. He wanted, he said, you keep mentioning um, penetration tests that you've had. I assume you got a report. And I said, yes. And he said, can I have copies of the report? And I said, no. And he said, why not? Yeah. He said, the public has a right to know. And I said, I agree that the public has a right to know. They have the right to know enough information to know what, what's going on, but they don't have a right to know all the detail right. on this particular instance. And there's an exemption for that in, in state law. Um, and he kept pressing me, and he sent me a FOIA and, and uh, Freedom of Information uh, Act uh, letter, and, and I said, no. And my response was, if I gave you the, the, the report, I might as well just put it in an envelope and no, fill out the envelope yeah. and say Kremlin and just send it to them. Yeah. And, you know, we're not going to make it easy for the for our bad actors to get at this stuff. 
but we want to assure people that we're doing the right thing. That line, that line is very interesting to me too. How do we maintain it appropriately? And as I'm sure it is to you as well. Do we have other questions? Just that too. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Update as to where we are, what other fields and so on are to be added to it. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that, that we did the Secretary of State discussion, I don't know if you were in, uh, John, they were talking about, among other things, uh, looking at traffic coming in uh, uh, from Russia to Ukraine and so on that might be suspicious in nature. But it, it, it occurs to me, isn't a lot of that traffic actually masked? So it appears to be coming from someplace else. I mean, I, I can sit here with my, my VPN. And I can send an email to you and send it from the server in Romania or Slovakia or Serbia. And I mean, that's just that's common software that's easily available. Yeah, Is I, that think, a, I think there's multiple methods for, yeah. you know, where, where the destination IP says it's from isn't necessarily the case. Or, yeah. you know, it doesn't mean that it's not one country acting in another country to, to mask where, they're, where it's actually coming from. I think those are common practices. Yeah. Is that, is that an, an issue as far as you're concerned? When you're talking about the possibility of uh, getting hit by Russia, for example, uh, you're looking at patterns as opposed to just simply IP addresses. I'm That's assuming. right. Yep. And so usually, you know, it, there's a process that we go through that Nick could get more granular with, but mm -hmm. um, you know when we see patterns of traffic that that are suspect or you know may may appear to be doing something that we don't like, we can block it immediately. Um, so you know we watch for those types of things and um, certainly are on the lookout and have different capabilities and softwares and and skill sets that we have monitoring. Including the Arch University. Just as a, uh, an, an overall note for our, our future meetings, uh, it would be it would be useful if there are handouts. Uh, as we went through Nick's presentation, which I thought was great, unfortunately I couldn't read it. And it would be it would be very useful to have hard copies of any PowerPoints so that we could review. And if it's a confidential uh, program, then hand the handouts back so that we could actually yep. view what we're doing. And when we look at things like the matrix, yeah. that either issue the matrix with a magnifying glass <laughs> or ensure that anything that we yeah. get is a nine point type or higher. Yeah. <laughs> we have them here. The, Can I please have a word? The no copies of the <laughs> executive <laughs> session was uh, my call. I apologize yeah. for that. I, I didn't think about how small yeah. it would be up there on the screen. I just knew that we'd be <laughs> displaying it. Like, Why would anyone need a copy? <laughs> Thank you for that. Trying to protect our trees. Thank you. For our eyes. So we did make a couple uh, of updates to the sheet, just basically uh, things that we found in error or that we had uh, mislabeled. Um, but as far as what else you guys would like to see on the sheet, you know, I, 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 need, I guess we need to know what, at what level of granularity are you looking for because we provide you know, dozens and dozens of services and they're very specific sometimes to each department or each agency. So it's, it's, it's difficult to um, to put on here and keep it within some kind of range in an Excel format. We do have what we call uh, service level agreements with each agency that spells out how many licenses they get, what's included in the service, how many virtual machines they have, all of those types of things for each agency that, we're, that is our customer. Um, and so we have that granularity in house. It doesn't necessarily fit on a spreadsheet by any means. Yeah, I think what we're, we're looking for is, 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 is our task is to provide oversight to look at those fields that might help us understand What's if there are areas that oversight ought to be provided by your agency or that we ought to have an understanding of mm -hmm. generally as to whether or not these risks are being covered, that that is what we're looking for in the sheet. We're trying to assess risk and we're trying to assess what things we should be doing better or differently or that we're not doing at all. Okay. I think the other thing that we're looking for is something that may be qualitative. And by that, uh, the red, yellow, green is always uh, uh, useful. And there is your assessment of areas 
or departments of, of government or agencies of government that we should focus on because there are priority vulnerabilities that are yet not yet addressed or not being addressed properly, right, sufficiently. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, and I'm sure other members may have other things that they're looking for. So on, on this uh, spreadsheet, I would say that uh, project management services should be included mm -hmm. because you know, projects yep. range from yeah. you know, anywhere from a, from a couple thousand dollars to hundred million dollars mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be worth worthwhile to put on here we did recently build a uh, power BI dashboard which is the uh, dashboard that'll uh, give a lot of our KPIs and metrics uh, and we, we did this and, and it's available to all of the public um, and this this does everything from staffing to threats um, service level agreements grades that we get from each agency um, and as you can see you know at the bottom here, number of IT projects, healthy IT projects. Uh, right. And so there's quite a bit of information that we're trying to display right on our website in, in real time. And we're updating this um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, and you know, one thing I would say is the overall grade is something that we focused on a lot from our supporting agencies. I think that's really that's really important to us, but it's really important to me on making sure that I understand whether or not we're uh, improving the service that we're offering to the agencies that we support or whether we're reducing that. With a new agency, I think that's extremely important to monitor that. So that grade that, is from your customers? And that grade is from our customers through surveys that we do mm -hmm. um, based, on, based on a wide variety of questions. Before, in the old DII model, it was when you submit a help desk ticket, um, it may kick you, a, kick you a survey that says, how was my service? Um, and what we found was we were running at like 97%, you know, uh, um, satisfaction. And I just didn't believe that would be true. <laughs> you know, that's just way too high for yeah. a, yeah. Well, but you solved those particular help tickets. Yeah, and just based on the questions. And, and so we've, we've asked a lot more questions in a lot of different ways. and. Uh, come up with a formula that you know gives us a wide range of grades here as you can see from you know B's to C pluses and um, we, we want to be you know transparent and monitor those over time so we can track how we're doing it'll take a while to really see a trend but we're we're watchful of it and my my entire executive staff is is monitoring this on a regular basis so what's interesting to me here when I look at so when I look at this sheet uh, and cybersecurity, uh, it's just thinking about and understanding how uh, these other branches of government. So I mean, it seems clear to me we need to have judiciary, legislature, um, talk with the treasurer, attorney general, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I. I uh, It's interesting to me to think about. Um, I don't know enough about whether or not that is appropriate, if that's better or worse, <laughs> more risk, less risk. Uh, so I think a separation of powers issues in some right. ways as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When you look at the legislative mm -hmm. branches, it had a great deal of sensitivity about being a separate branch of government and right. how that relationship. And I'm sure that sentiment is also shared in the judiciary. Yep. Um, on the other hand, um, at some point you have to assess um, the inherent risk in some of that, um, some of those traditional um, delineations. The uh, um, other part you had mentioned was um, project management, yeah. and as a big piece. And we did have um, a presentation last time with what's happening with integrated eligibility. And a couple of years ago, before, um, there was not even a reporting, and we were having an inventory now of all the projects that you are managing above a certain level. Yep. And that report is available as well, right, to us? That's correct. Everything, yeah. This coming year, it'll be everything above $500,000. Right. Will be the reported. threshold was really, um, the right. originally was very, yeah, before. yeah. yeah. Um, so that will be coming in terms of the number of projects that are being managed? Absolutely, okay. yep. That's okay. part of our reporting to the legislature yeah. that will, uh, I think it's December 15th, we hand in that report. Okay. 
Okay. That'll be everything over five hundred thousand dollars. When when you start looking at the list from we track everything now, right? Before, you know, we didn't really track anything below yeah. a certain dollar threshold. Yeah. And that's why the project, you know, the number of five key projects is at three hundred and six is because we're we're at least tracking the projects that are even a few thousand dollars and having those uh, developers who may be managing that that small project report in certain certain fields on those projects. So the big ones we'll still have a report for, and we can get you additional information if needed on the smaller ones. But we didn't want to give you 300 pages of project data. I think that's wise because it wouldn't be read, right? Um, right. Frankly, um, well, maybe by Marty. <laughs> um, so uh, last time we heard um, on, on integrated eligibility, mm -hmm. and now that in certain areas and we're a little behind, um, we also have a, a major um, funded through the capital bill, the uh, case management system for the courts. Mm -hmm. um, DMV is doing some incremental work on, uh, so I, I'm just wondering for future meetings, are there certain um, key projects in terms of um, our keeping uh, current um, that uh, things are going um, pretty much the key questions are they on on track and are they on budget mm -hmm. and I don't know whether there are certain ones that we might want to get an update on but I think that's absolutely a great question senator um, you know we have two <coughs> tentatively slated to hear from in August one would be just a brief update I think on the vision system um, and then also, we were scheduled, I think, to hear back from um, integrated eligibility just to continue to hear. We'd ask them when it would be appropriate. Um, are there others that are at the top of big cost um, specifically funded? Some of the smaller ones are just done through yeah, there's just operating budgets, but you know, are there any that um, there, are at the top of that list? I'm, I don't know. I don't want to sort of, you know, like. The court, the case well, management. Yeah. Uh, there's, so there's, we don't go you know, through um, ADS for the case management system. For project okay. management. For project management. Oh, you don't. Okay. All right. So, but other areas of yeah, project management. Yeah, we can certainly recommend some. Uh, the JFO and uh, your consultant uh, Dan Smith that, um, track a list of projects yeah. that they've um, worked with the legislature on. I'm assuming to deem which ones. They feel they should be tracking, and I think there's five or six on the list, including the progress of ADS. Yeah. Um, but if there's, I can certainly make recommendations of additional ones that I'm watching closely, whether because yeah. of their status be, or because of the dollar amount. We talk, maybe or Catherine public. can talk yeah. to Dan. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we would be happy to hear that. I, you know, I wonder if we should hear about the court system because I think it would be great to actually also hear about yeah, we'd be cybersecurity. Happy to. We, we, we gave several presentations during the session. Do we have other questions for Secretary Quinn on this sheet? Okay, sure. so I think we've reserved a few minutes to just talk about our next agenda and any other things we might like to talk about here. Um, thank you very much. Sorry to yeah. not have put those together. We will try to put those together. <coughs> Consolidated torture. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's only once a month. It's okay. <laughs> so, so a couple of items that we definitely do have. Uh, we definitely have uh, integrated eligibility. Another update from them, and they were here for about what was it here for thirty minutes last time. Yeah, at least. That's cast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would find I, you know, I made the mistake of pushing print. And got all 47 slides or whatever it was. I, you know, I think it's for time efficiency. I really would like to uh, boil it down to what what are the key pieces of work? What is that time frame to have them um, completed? Um, how we're tracking and expenditure. To me, um, uh, you know, that whole descriptive. Um, um, I. Maybe it's because I've, we've had so many, some of us have had so many presentations, but I would really like to have um, um, more succinct presentations to help us just answer those key um, questions about uh, the project progress, um, where, we're, where we're not meeting the, the um, time frame, where something seems to be over budgeted. And um, so I don't know how to 
yep. uh, communicate that, but um, so, yes, uh, Dan. Dan Smith, the GFO IT consultant. I spoke with Cass Madison after that last meeting and talked about the strengths and the weaknesses of her presentation. Okay. And we agreed that the next one will have a one-page summary to start out. To Which is what I exactly wanted, was right. to take, distill for me what are the key areas yes. that we need to be um, uh, tracking. So prior to the, her next presentation, she's going to run the draft through me, okay. and, and I will look at it. In okay. that Thank you, Dan. I, I mm -hmm. talked to Dan yeah. afterwards, it's saying, you know, it's hard for, it's hard to communicate. More is not necessarily right. better, right. or yeah. more is good if you want to obfuscate things. <laughs> right. Okay. So we want to it's follow up. To I think with yeah. um, Cass to make sure that she knows she's on the schedule. I think we're probably let's. 15 minutes? I mean, I we just have some. Yeah, I would think. I think we're looking for a brief update um, on that. Okay. Is and that number one on the agenda, first thing? Well, or do you want to do that after? We may want to shuffle yeah, around exactly afterwards, but. That's what it is that um, you want to cover. I think we want 15 minutes. So if I might, Dan can give you one minute over here with the vision sure. session and who or why. Sure. Uh, so the vision system uh, was the upgrade that was going back in February, and that was one of the projects that. I was assigned to monitor over the past couple of years. We had some years that were not really moving strongly. So that project finished, and it's it was a, a success in the sense that it finished on time, on budget, the objectives were met. There were some areas that uh, may not have been as successful as they liked. Uh, they did a, a customer survey after the completion and said, you know, how did this work for you, the users? users? And there were some areas that users reported dissatisfaction with. So um, I've gone back and forth with the people involved in that project, and I think it would be good for them to give you their perspective of what worked, what didn't, uh, you know, mm -hmm. just just how the thing turned out now that it's done. Okay. And, and, the, and, and maybe the lack of some sensitivity to some of the end users are, I don't want to, I'm being baby too extreme. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, flavoring. So it's a yeah. end of project completion retrospective. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. From, from vision as a topic? Yeah. Okay, and, and, and for the legislators in the room, that, that was um, uh, the expense reporting change that happened just after the Super Bowl. <laughs> Personalized. The, 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 the endless barrage of user guides I was pushing to you and, 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 and that whole process when doing your expenses switched. So who would we have to come in and report on that? And we do have, who would you have on the, any customer users or is there anybody in particular? No, I, I think, um, I think, Ruth Ellen? If, yeah, if, if she presents the survey results and, and how they respond, I think that's probably going to okay. cover that base. And so I, I would like to have the uh, judiciary come and talk about cybersecurity. Also, um, I'd like to uh, and their, an update and on, their their, project. on the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Judiciary. So, how long would that seems like you're probably going to need some time for that and, and I actually want to introduce for the committee the concept or the notion of possibly having a longer meeting mm. um, in August or September uh, you know I think there's a few things that we may need to kind of grapple with so uh, with 30 minutes left. for both for cybersecurity and for your your project updates? Yes, uh, given that cybersecurity okay. is a, a topic that we also partner with ADS on, so. You do? So that's 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not, that is not listed on this sheet. It talks about network services. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so that would be. Perimeter, we, we monitor our perimeter firewall, which I think is what Jessica the other Okay. As far as websites, web services, if they're outside of EIC, we would have we would have did those. So I guess you could call it a partial. So, for me, it would be helpful if ADS was also here, so that we could understand. We is that right. okay? Mm -hmm. Great. So, let's plan for that then. And then, um, I I today would like to hear from the Attorney General's office regarding um, that contract um, for DHS and oh. uh, the security of <coughs> the monitor's information. I think that's, I don't know the how the committee feels issue. about that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, mm -hmm. about um, not releasing uh, 
in giving uh, information to the federal to the government. Federal, to the federal government. Yeah. Yeah. And, and since they're going to be here, um, it would be good to speak with them also about cybersecurity 